Welcome to Decktivation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Jack Clare. Jack is the Chief Information Officer of United Natural Foods Incorporated, or UNFI, which with $24 billion in annual revenue is the largest publicly traded grocery wholesaler distributor in the United States. He's been in that role since March of 2020, meaning he started the very month that many of us entered quarantine as a result of the pandemic. This is a topic we'll cover in some detail with him. Uh, Jack has a wealth of experience in the food and beverage and quick serve restaurant industry. His prior role was as senior vice president and CIO for Duncan for roughly two and a half years. And he would advance uh, to become the chief information and strategy officer of that company for his final five years with it. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, his career journey, but of course, uh, more specifics of his role at uh, UNFI. Uh, Jack, great to see you again. Thank you for joining me on Technovation. Yeah, same here, Peter. Excited to do it. Excellent. Well, Jack, uh, maybe you can take a little bit of time and provide just a brief overview of, of UNFI's business uh, and your purview as Chief Information Officer of it. Sure, absolutely. So as you covered, um, Peter, uh, we are the, the largest publicly traded uh, grocery wholesaler, uh, born out of really two fairly diverse businesses um, in overall grocery. The, the first was uh, UNFI itself, so United Natural Foods, uh, grew originally and, and for decades as one of the original organic focused uh, wholesalers in grocery back before, as I say, uh, organic was cool uh, and sizable. Um, but they, uh, they grew the business uh, initially and, and to this day still as one of the key partners for Whole Foods markets now owned by Amazon. Uh, but we are still uh, their uh, primary supplier. And obviously, as that share of the market has expanded, uh, UNFI grew uh, kind of pre-pandemic and pre-acquisition uh, to about a $10 billion uh, in their own right, uh, grocery wholesalers, again, focused in organic. Uh, almost two years before I got here, uh, they made the strategic decision to acquire a what's called traditional or conventional a grocery wholesale business uh, called Super Value based out of um, Minneapolis, uh, which really combined uh, the concept of an organic focused distributor with a conventional focused distributor. So now we like to say uh, we can be the, the one-stop shop uh, for uh, any retail customer, either if they're trying to expand into organic, if they are focused in organic, or if they just need the more traditional center store and and assortment uh, across, you know, all categories, um, food product types. So uh, it's it's a, a fabulous uh, business. Uh, it turns out that people continue to eat. And uh, <laughs> in the pandemic, uh, I, I was hired uh, as chief information officer, as you said, a traditional corporate role. So, um, you know, uh, global responsibility for uh, corporate systems, as well as uh, everything that runs our business out in our distribution system, uh, centers. So, um, you know, in the pandemic, uh, it has been uh, an interesting ride uh, for the last year. Obviously, we've, we're one of the, the few industries that has done quite well, as um, most consumers have had to curtail everything out of home, and instead, um, many have, have learned how to cook again, or at least um, uh, purchase for uh, consumption at home. Uh, so that's uh, that's been an interesting ride. And, and now, obviously, as things unwind and we all hope uh, return to a new normal, whatever that turns out to be, uh, of course, you know, uh, some of that boon may recede, but, but we're still very bullish on uh, overall uh, prospects going forward. Jack, a lot of businesses, as you point out, uh, have not been so advantaged during the course of the past 15 or 16 months. And as a result, it's the, the trials and tribulations of that period that have led to really dramatic change, uh, in some cases, dramatic change for the good, acceleration of digital transformation, accelerating uh, the, the, the development of new digital means of collaborating with customers, digital revenue streams, digital means of, of, of uh, gauging the health of the operation and of employees, and so on. You mentioned yours is an organization that's done quite well. If anything, demand increased as people learned to cook, as you pointed out, as, as uh, um, options to eat out, for example, uh, were limited for quite some time. I wonder, actually, uh, in light of those circumstances, did your organization have any sort of similar 
push towards a broader acceleration of digital without Winston Churchill's whole notion of don't let a good crisis go to waste. It wasn't necessarily a crisis to your company. So I'm curious how that translated into an organization like UNFI. Yeah, some of that, uh, whether we wanted it to or not, we were forced into it. So um, we we still have a couple of banners, although we've stated publicly our, our ultimate uh, strategy is to divest. Um, Super Value had a number of retail customer banners. Uh, I think in general, we would say we don't like to compete with our predominant customers uh, by being a retailer ourselves. So ultimately, uh, we'll, we'll likely divest those last two. Um, but uh, just having them with us, we saw everything uh, going on at retail, and obviously we were the benefactor of all of the, the demand being pulled through uh, by our retail customers. But it also forced us, even in our you know, strategic or go-forward business, to expand and exploit uh, our own e-commerce channels. You know, one thing I find very interesting is that, by and large, restaurant um, uh, wholesale has already largely digitized or gone to e-commerce, um, while grocery had not. Uh, and I, I sort of attribute just my own analysis uh, that to a couple of factors. One, grocery, just because of its scale, had already digitized, unfortunately, a couple decades ago via EDI. So the vast majority of our um, ordering and order processing is already digitized, even though we wouldn't really think of that as e-commerce, but we're not really taking many orders by phone or fax or any other method. It, it is already electronic. Uh, so the push to a more um, contemporary, let's call it, you know, e-commerce paradigm has, has been less. However, we do have, um, a, you know, a, a small growing business of e-commerce that is B2B with our retail customers. Uh, again, because uh, restaurants tend to be more fractured and they are buying smaller volumes much more frequently when they've got to resupply the thing they just went out of. When you're ordering for shelves and shelves, uh, that's much more um, planable. You have better forecasting uh, and you have to have you know, electronic support by EDI and other channels. But restaurants were able to go to uh, typical e-commerce sooner uh, but what we found is that there is still a need, even with, uh, you know, a grocery retailer to um, either make small exception purchases. So, for example, think of our, our natural customers. They like to procure a lot of local product and assortment, you know, adjacent or proximate to a, a particular retail store. They want the regional assortment uh, from perhaps local farms or, or local suppliers. Well, that lends itself to e-commerce very well when you're not buying an entire truckload from a distribution center that's more traditional volume uh, wholesaling. Uh, so we uh, had already started and established an e-commerce business available to all of our customers that then uh, is fulfilled through traditional, you know, parcel or, or the uh, commercial carrier, um, you know, packages. So it could be small piece pick. Um, you know, maybe larger up to a half pallet we might send, uh, you know, uh, via, you know, a, a more uh, typical third party logistics uh, provider. But all of it is in, think of it, box sizes versus pallet sizes. Uh, that exploded as well. Um, we had a very good year, not unlike what uh, retailers saw from consumers ordering online when they didn't want to risk entering a store uh, or deal with, you know, masking and the rest of it. They could stay in their car. They could do curbside or even delivery. Um, so a lot of what I think we saw in uh, restaurants and consumer channels, uh, we started to see as well in our B2B wholesale channels. Very interesting. And now, uh, you know, a, a year and change into your, actually coming up to uh, maybe even like 18 months into your your role, how talk a bit about where you see things going now? What 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 aspects of the strategy are you and the team now working on? What are some of those areas of emphasis now that perhaps a some sort of a modicum of normalcy might be returning? Let's hope anyway it continues to return uh, to our country, our economy. Yeah, I, um, it's interesting. I think uh, the obvious thing is uh, while. Uh, distribution wholesale is is a great business. At the, at the end of the day, someone still has to move product. Um, so you could call that a defensive industry if you want, but uh, it is going to persist. Um, the, the brown boxes don't get places on their own. 
uh, let alone pallets and, and high volume uh, you know, distribution either. So uh, while that will continue, and of course we'd love as much market share and, and think we have a great strategic offering both in breadth as well as because of the volume uh, of our share of the market, uh, we can do it very efficiently and cost effectively versus you know, some of our competition. Uh, I think what we really see as the growth areas that will only grow by the share of you know, food at home, if you will, in traditional grocery. Um, so now we're starting to say, well, are there other categories you know, beyond just strictly grocery we might want to expand into? Uh, we're also looking at uh, e-commerce where it might offer us uh, channels uh, outside of our traditional model. So for instance, we just launched a couple of months ago a, uh, a marketplace, which we call Community, uh, which is available to not only our current customers, but, but any retail customer where we can match them, again, small uh, emerging brands perhaps that don't have the volume yet to use or approach our distribution system, but it allows a retailer to purchase from a supplier directly. And just because of our breadth of offering, uh, we might have a supplier relationship and they want to try a new brand, or perhaps it's an emerging supplier that uh, wants to partner with us, but again, just doesn't have the volume through any channel of retail yet. Uh, so that's a way for us to match suppliers with a lot of our traditional um, retail customers, but yet they can try at small volume, low risk, and procure directly uh, from the, the supplier themselves. Yeah, very interesting. You talked about the acquisition of Super Value, which predates your time with the company, the integration of, of which I'm sure continues into your into your time with the organization, the divestiture to come that you referred to as well. Uh, I know that from our past conversations that this um, uh, gave you reason to think a bit more about modernization activities and continuing to uh, ensure that yours is an organization that is building um, building towards the future. I wonder if you could take a moment and to talk about some of the areas that you've emphasized. What have been some of the most important areas to modernize from your perspective from which value has been derived? Sure. Uh, well, first, let me share a, a little bit of history. Um, grocery as an industry has largely grown through acquisition just because particularly at the wholesale you know, channel, uh, scale wins because you can be much more efficient, you can provide much more of an offering. So both of those companies, even before the acquisition, had themselves separately grown through acquisition. So I have a lot of, um, maybe less politely, we might call it deferred maintenance, um, but you know, uh, otherwise, uh, strategically, we had just not integrated uh, a lot of those past acquisitions. So in some cases, I've inherited not just the two systems uh, to rationalize, but I have six, eight, or more of the same thing. I have nine warehouse management systems in our network of 60-odd uh, distribution centers today. Uh, so we we are, you're right, um, currently addressing that. Um, what I see as the opportunity, though, is where perhaps in a lot of those areas, we have still decades-old um, systems. There is huge opportunity for us to enable our business, and today, I'm sort of still here with an elephant on my foot. I, I can move a little bit, but to do anything in monolithic software that you know has been decades in the making uh, is quite an endeavor. And I just can't be as agile as a lot of the, the very services-oriented, modular, on distributed platforms, cloud-based in, in you know, surely the, the modern era, uh, where I can build up a system in minutes or an hour and then destroy it just as fast if we no longer need it uh, to really try and test something, uh, try something out, uh, or expand it in a true uh, production system that is highly available, highly redundant, uh, and very cost effective. So we are trying to leap in some cases several generations of um, both software and you know, hardware or platform, let's say, uh, to modernize some of our systems. And, and we're highly focused on first, the things that uh, our customers feel. So providing them, uh, you know, modern, uh, not just um, uh, web portals, but uh, native apps uh, for discrete uh, applications. For example, in grocery, there's a lot of uh, shelf uh, side ordering, if you will. So uh, you could imagine, you know, someone's uh, going down uh, the aisle and they see an empty shelf. So they hit it with uh, a, bar, you know, hit a barcode with a scanner 
and then indicate a quantity and order right on the spot. Um, so we're providing a lot of those capabilities and focused on those. And then the other major focus area would be in our distribution centers. We can do a lot. There are a lot of innovative uh, processes to both improve our accuracy and to make um, you know, the warehouse environment and role uh, much easier to execute. So we're partnered heavily with our supply chain and operations leadership uh, to try and modernize uh, what's out in our distribution centers as well. Very interesting. Thank you for providing that overview. Uh, I also wanted to talk about, as I mentioned at the outset, that you began at the beginning of the quarantine. Uh, you began in March of 2020. Uh, what an interesting time to onboard with an organization, get to know an executive team, get to know your, the team that you were leading. Uh, I'm sure it led to a lot of uh, creative approaches to, to work your way into the culture and learn more about this company that you were joining. Talk about uh, that that, uh, that experience, if you would, and I, I'd be interested if you wouldn't mind, Jack, uh, understanding from your perspective how it's colored your perspective on onboarding people after you for having gone through that yourself. Yeah, I um, well, let's hope we don't have to do this again anytime soon, um, but uh, you're right, it's, it was, it was a uh, very odd timing out of uh, no, no uh, particular plan of mine, but I, I happened to leave restaurant retail just as everything was shutting down, you know, stores were closing, layoffs were ensuing. Um, every retailer was uh, taking out, uh, particularly in restaurants, uh, once, once things were shaking out, it was clear that everyone was moving to eat at home, uh, taking out their credit lines, et cetera. And then I arrive over here in uh, grocery wholesale, you know, within a few weeks and businesses through the roof, you know, volumes we couldn't handle or were afraid we couldn't handle. Um, we even partnered, I think it's uh, well known, um, with uh, one of the major restaurant wholesalers, U.S. Foods, uh, to help us with some of the volume just because of uh, the sheer throughput that, that we were experiencing. As far as actually onboarding and thinking about onboarding going forward, uh, so I am, you're right, about 14 months in here. I have been in my office twice. And last week in one of our first um, face-to-face -face meetings, we're, we're doing a couple of workshops uh, trying to plan forward. I met some direct reports of mine for the first time. So the first time we ever laid eyes on each other. Um, I I guess I take that a couple of ways. First, it can be done, right? So I've onboarded, I, yeah, not as fast or efficiently as when you can, you know, the proverbial water cooler conversation or you're in a conference room with your peers or, you know, your boss or people who work for you. It is slower uh, is my experience to really get to know people and know the group and the culture, um, but it can be done. Um, I think, you know, thinking about this in the future, uh, I am a believer, we, we haven't settled on what we want to do as a company going forward. So please take this as, as just an opinion of one. Um, I am a big fan of the fact that now suddenly we can be much more flexible in our hiring. Um, as I, I might uh, say it candidly, I, you know, certain skill sets, not every, but a lot of what we do in technology um, you can be based anywhere. You can be on the moon as long as you can get to the internet uh, and accomplish your job. So I see that as a potential leverage point or advantage over competitors who might not choose that policy or approach. If we can now nationally or even globally source for almost any role instead of requiring them to be near some corporate population center. Yeah, very interesting, uh, interesting perspective. And I'm sure that's in some ways coloring the way at least you were thinking about opinion one, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, yeah. Th thinking about, uh, you know, the team of the future and where that team might reside as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, Jack, I also wanted to, to ask you, you've been, uh, I believe it's like 13 years or so since you first became a chief information officer at Yum uh, prior to your time at Duncan, which I mentioned before. Uh, so you've been a CIO in three different organizations. You um, you have seen the evolution of the role. You've had uh, dual responsibilities, including the strategy role at Duncan while also being the CIO. You've lived through uh, great trials and tribulations, uh, two, two different economic downturns uh, as a CIO as well. I wonder if you could just take a moment and reflect on, on the evolution of the role. And 
how you see um, see it gaining traction even further or influencing uh, corporations to a greater degree than perhaps what you you might have seen thirteen roughly thirteen years or so ago when you first took on uh, took on a post to CIO. Yeah, if, if you're okay, I'll even extend the the window a little more. Um, I was a divisional IT leader prior to that with. Um, uh, Constellation Brands today, yeah. actually initially with their their little fine wine business uh, on the west coast of the U.S., uh, but grew up there for about a decade. So I've actually seen probably a solid 20 years of corporate IT. I consulted prior to that and, and military service uh, before I did that. But uh, in the corporate IT environment, I, I've said for some time, I've seen the entire evolution where we started out as a utility function to the business. We implemented devices. We brought you a machine and plugged them into the wall and got you connected. Um, we implemented hardware in you know, uh, process-oriented industries where uh, something needed to be installed, implemented, supported, maintained. Um, you know, over the 20 years, and, and to your point earlier, uh, some of the justification of, of my CEO at Duncan, uh, the reason he gave me the strategy role was he couldn't imagine uh, anything that was key to our strategy going forward that wasn't implemented by uh, IT. Uh, so now we're sort of a, a, if not the strategic enabler for the business. And we touch all parts of the business, traditional, all the corporate functions, but every process area uh, that enables, which also makes us critical. And when things break, everybody notices as well. Um, but uh, that's a that's a fascinating evolution if you think about it from very functional utilitarian to uh, now very strategic enabling. And if we don't get it right, um, you know, we can also really break the business um, as, as my boss uh, says often, whenever we're deploying something, just don't break the business. Uh, that's That's an interesting 20 years. There was a time when we were a nice to have, and now we're we're a, a critical part of of operations. Yeah, it's a great great summation. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to to, to hear at the, the close of our conversation ask you about trends that excite you as you look to the future. You talked a little bit about some that that uh, reflect the evolution of the industry you're currently in. Uh, but as you look forward, let's say three years, what are some of the things that are beginning to make their way into your mind and onto your roadmap? Uh, well, let's see. Um, it's certainly, and I have actually lived through this once, so now we're just starting the same path here, but uh, the cloud migration is certainly first. That's that's not so future as here, right? Uh, just the flexibility it gives you, uh, the ability, and frankly, you know, uh, cost reduction and efficiency, but, but more focused on the efficiency and your ability to you know, quickly scale up, scale down, or, you know, pivot um, in a moment is unbelievable. If, if I were to maybe think a little farther out for the, you know, the, the, I'll call it airline magazine technologies that everybody reads about and says they've got to have some of that too. Um, you know, I think some are oversold. Let's, let's think um, uh, blockchain, you know, I, there are very specific processes where, you know, this concept of a, an immutable distrib distributed ledger is valuable, but there aren't that many. Uh, I, would, I would, you know, argue there are some that have been implemented more to say they were cool and used blockchain that really just needed a little more process discipline. So I, I think, um, you know, it, it entertains us with all of the uh, cryptocurrencies that have uh, resulted, but from a you know, corporate business process enablement perspective, I, I think blockchain, you know, um, will, will be interesting in only select areas. Now, I look at uh, where machine learning and AI together are, uh, you know, sort of holding out promise, um, you know, some discrete implementation that can really be pointed to so far. But I think by and large, the benefit of um, let's go back to really, um, you know, modern uh, computational processing volumes, um, whether it's, you know, true AI or, or ML. Um, I, I think just our ability to, um, you know, analyze quickly and then make a different decision or learn from a quick decision and quickly pivot, 
uh, has all sorts of even not, not yet conceived applications. So that's one where I know we're all investing and, and some folks are starting to get some promise out of them. But I also know that uh, anything in the reporting data space these days is labeled AI or ML. And I, I mean, true, you know, uh, learning and, and correcting based on perhaps unplanned uh, data points or input uh, to make new decisions. Uh, so that's one that, that gets me very excited. Um, and then there are a couple that, you know, uh, specific to our industry and some of our problems, you know, RPA uh, certainly holds out a lot of, pro a lot of opportunity in, um, you know, physical process areas. You could imagine uh, we'd love to automate a whole bunch of things uh, that, that are, you know, still require uh, human labor and decision today. Um, so we're looking at those. We're, we're looking at a lot of, you know, physical warehouse applications. You know, Amazon has done a, a fabulous job. You know, some of the other very large networks out there um, are already leveraging some, some interesting technology. So we see some in, in our DCs and then more broadly, I think those that, that all of, uh, you know, corporate IT across industry will leverage going forward. You mentioned that, you know, for some time now, you've been the, the primary supplier to Whole Foods. Whole Foods now part of, as you point out, uh, part of Amazon. And in your response, even talking a bit about some of the, you know, what you're, what you're learning from uh, or what you might infer from being a partner of Amazon's as well. I'm curious, I would just to, to linger on that point a little bit longer, Jack, I'm curious, um, it must be a very, very interesting from that perspective to have reason to think about the evolution of that business. I realize, of course, that the, the acquisition of Whole, Whole Foods predates your time with UNFI, uh, but curious about, you know, as you, as you uh, work with an organization that has as its parents, at least one of the most technologically sophisticated organizations, you know, the are, are, do, do you find there are opportunities to learn from their journey uh, as as a as a result of being part of the, the Amazon's you know broader broader family, so to say? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think there was uh, again predating me, but I'm sure there was lots of anxiety. And if you look at the you know the historical pressure on the stock of our company, um, I'm sure there was lots of concern there. But uh, you know since then, and and you know, and we've announced this. Um, you know, they have extended their uh, a partnership agreement with us, Whole Foods, uh, out to 2027. So there's no intent to try and, if you will, do it themselves anytime soon. Um, we can, of course, learn from Amazon. They've been a, a fab fabulous business in a whole lot of areas. I, I sort of focus on the, the process areas of running an enormous uh, network, which is essentially what we're doing, just more focused specifically on grocery. Um, but I, you know, I also think they're stubbing their toes as well with a grocery retailer and learning that that's not quite the same as other forms of retail. Um, surely they can add a lot to the e-commerce use case uh, where you could order and have uh, delivered to you, not unlike any other Amazon products. Uh, but as they try to automate and enable and, and really make their in-store operations uh, even more effective. Um, it, it turns out it's not quite as easy as everybody would like to, to think it is. Uh, but um, they, they've been a great partner of ours and Amazon in their own right is actually a, a very meaningful customer of ours, even setting aside the Whole Foods uh, piece of the business. So it, it's been a great partnership. It's also nice not to be a retailer that feels threatened by uh, Amazon, of course, but uh, they're a great partner and, and, you know, of course we can learn a great deal from them going forward. Well, Jack Claire, thank you so much uh, for sharing some of your wisdom so that we can learn from your journey as a, a longtime CIO, multiple organizations, your most recent experiences at UNFI, uh, your experience across the most unusual year uh, of onboarding and becoming, uh, becoming a leader within the organization, uh, as well as providing some perspectives on what the future holds for an organization like yours. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, my pleasure, Peter. Always good to catch up.